Hi, my name is Andrew Martin, and welcome to another edition of In the Artist's Words from the William Campbell Contemporary Art Gallery in Fort Worth, Texas. Today, we are very, very happy to meet and introduce to you John Fraser. John, welcome. Pleased to meet you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Great to be here. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Let's get to know John a little bit up close and personal with a little bit of biographical information on him. He is an Illinois boy, born and bred. Yes. And uh, from born actually in Chicago, in Chicago, Illinois. He went to two different schools. One started out at Simpson College in Iowa. He needed actually first immediately majoring in art already in the famous Nutrier High School uh, in Winnetka, Illinois. So already at the age of a high school student, he knew exactly what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. And he went on to Simpson College in Iowa and then majored in art at Roosevelt University, which is back in uh, Chicago. Yes, 1975. 1975. For those of us that remember it. <laughs> and, uh, this is his first show at the William Campbell Contemporary uh, Gallery in Fort Worth, and the show is called Recess and Relief, and there are 25 pieces in the show. Uh, he has, uh, this is his first show at the Dallas Fort Worth area. He has uh, shown twice in Texas, he, uh, already in San Antonio and in Austin, and um, I was particularly curious, I asked John in advance of this uh, particular broadcast about uh, in his visits, in his countless visits to the Art Institute of Chicago, that very famous museum in Chicago, uh, what, were, what were some of his most influential works that he saw as a young child growing up. And he mentioned Monet's uh, Haystacks and Water Lilies, and also a great big black work, it's called, by Clifford Still. But let's get on to the work at hand in this particular show. Yes. John, uh, walk us through this first work called Where and When Window Meets Wall. What was your initial inspiration for this work? Uh, the title refers to an overarching content with many of my works for a number of years. So these are all continuations of the body of work that was begun perhaps 10 years ago. And I was trained as a painter. Uh, I'm also part of a generation of artists. I'm segueing a little bit, forgive me. Uh, Please. My generation of artists, when they came through school, you had to make a decision on two different kinds, form or content, and you make your decision whether you want to deal with content or materials and form, and that dictates what faculty you work with in whatever institution you're going to. Once those decisions are made and you make the enemies and friends that you've chosen to do, um, you slip into an area where hopefully you can deny any allegiance to any specific category, and my generation chooses to be able to approach any medium size, scale, money, whatever. So sculpture became something I was interested in in grad school. Uh, painting and drawing were always the underlying movement, and now my work is somewhat a hybrid of everything. And so this piece refers to, in its title, and you're gonna, you may not be able to tell in, until you see it in person, that this is a construction. It's a wall relief, you know, found material and uh, fabricated wood parts. Uh, it occupies the wall and addresses the viewer as a painting does, but it is a wall relief and perhaps partially a sculpture. The title is called Where and When Window Meets Wall. You might understand by the composition that it um, presents itself as perhaps an architectural design or composition where there's a window suggested or a piece of architecture suggested, and from that point of view, the title kicks in. And so it's all about this area where a transparent membrane meets a solid plane. One is uh, open and, and perhaps even though it's a boundary, you still can see outside, and it refers to that metaphor of the interior exterior. And this being a body, the of the object itself being a body, it refers to also the human form and the relationships of the interior and exterior within the human body as well. So Are there some favorite materials, almost found materials, that you like to work with and incorporate into your mixed Media? Absolutely. You'll see in many of the pieces there are elements that are a tool or a measuring device that perhaps has been rendered obsolete by current technology. I like that to be addressed in my work as well, relative to it being supportive of a previous time. Not that I'm nostalgic, but I, I think we are moving into this new thing so quickly without any basic respect for the past. And I think we need to embrace the past as well. And in this case, in the, for this particular work, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned ruler? It's a carpenter's tool. It's a carpenter's tool. Uh, which folds in, in, in an area, so you can fold it up and be compact in your pocket, and it opens up to different areas within that, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, etc. 
for use in measuring things. Did you have that particular artifact in your family? Uh, was that from your family's actually, collection? Of actually not. My, uh, my father was a clothing merchant, and um, I inherited things from him that was related to the apparel industry. But this is a tool really uh, relegated to a builder or a carpenter. It, is it a metaphor for something in your sort of in the pantheon of your artwork? Are you incorporating a measuring tool into your artwork? Well, it does refer to what I said before about a, a tool used to measure in relation to building something, whether it's a, a room or a, a building of sorts, or something even smaller than that, like a piece of art. But it also refers to me negotiating the picture plane, how I get from one side to the other. It's, it's split over to the left because we are Western, so we read from left to right, top to bottom. So it sort of refers to the Western orientation to art making and how I measure the time and control it. Shall we move on to the second work? Sure. Let's talk about this next work. It is entitled Lessons Learned One. Yes. Done in 2012. What is the first, what is the significance, the oblique significance? Well, of first the I should say that this is um, the first of what I believe will be an ongoing series of works with this title, with one, two, three, etc. afterwards. There is no guarantee that it will even go beyond two, two, which two are already in existence. It is a piece that it refers to a number of things. The oblique title is Lessons Learned, which might refer to me and what I've learned in the process of being an art maker, um, object maker. Somebody else decides whether it's art. Um, and I would say that it does refer to that in a very concrete way, but I'd also say that it refers to perhaps a belief that this could sub be substitute for a, a classroom of the past, where at the end of the day, the students would take their lessons and place them on a shelf and then go home. So it's all about, again, perhaps a previous time where learning was a little different, structured a little differently, and we handled that time differently, and we perhaps acquired the knowledge and roots differently. So it refers to that. But it's also just a concrete object with this varied horizon line going across these things. I was going to say, what I immediately noticed was sort of the varying uh, levels, if you will, within uh, the dimensions almost. There's been some talk about my use of books uh, as an act of destruction. And I will say that, and again, we're going off on a tangent here. I use the books in a way that is a loving, in loving homage to the book as a form. Uh, I try to touch upon the architecture of the book rather than the destructive aspect of rendering it obsolete. These things are on their way to the to a recycler or to the ground, and I rescued them, I believe, and I try to romance them back into a form. So this is sort of that the lessons learned and root about my education, how to how to deal with it in terms of the object quality and present it in a way that becomes, again, something that exists between painting and sculpture. These were real, these were real live books that you had found? Yes. Um, you and, they, and again, what I do is I use every part of the book, whether yeah. it's the cover itself, which has now been mounted to a furniture grade Baltic birch, or the pages themselves, which I alter and turn into pulp for other things, or I use some of the text sometimes. And I use the end papers in my collage work, some of which are in the gallery as well. and the bindings and all the little parts you'll see turn up. I try to recontextualize, perhaps give them a chance to have another life. Could you see doing something like this with a Kindle or with one of those digital readers? Uh, no. <laughs> now, I would also say that uh, work produced using a computer as a tool has gone so far in a very short period of time. We are moving that direction. That does not deny the need or the existence of the kind of work that I'm engaged in. Uh, object makers will always be here. People will always paint. They will always make a mark. They will always dig in the sand. 
they'll do all those things. But thank God we're getting into these new things where there's less waste, perhaps. There's a little less of that romantic aspect of opening a book and, and taking the time to read. But you pay the price. Does this particular work have some of your more favorite materials that you like to work with in terms of, in terms of the mixed media that you like to work with? As uh, we previously talked, which I'm sorry is not in the interview here, um, my work is produced out of a context where I work, and that is I work close to nature. I live on a piece of property where there's plenty of room, very little noise, very little pollution, and so I would say my work is grounded in nature. So paper and wood, being a product of nature, are essential to my work. They are related, but they're also very distinctly different. Wood is something that you know, supports the outer skin, and paper being very vulnerable, which is a metaphor for skin, and I find paper is something that we communicate with, or used to anyway, and it's something that's become very disposable, where wood is something that can be replenished and reused. And where does your proximity to one of the greatest cities in the world, Chicago, how does that play in to your art and to your inspiration in terms of that urban Well, I'm about an hour and 20 minute train ride from the city. And I have it when I want it, and I can get away from it when I don't want it. So it's, I'm very, very fortunate. Most of my colleagues and friends work in the city. What do you take from that environment when you go, when you dip into the city, in terms of how it's reflected in your art? I would say the, the architecture that makes Chicago what it is, and it's a, it's a global center as we all know, I would say all the people that are engaged in a creative activity, whether it's food, wine, music, visual arts, dance, Chicago is just this incredible place to be. The hair in the back, back, back of my neck is standing up as I'm saying this. Uh, it's just a great city to be from and live in. And city, work. city of big shoulders. It's, it's pretty incredible. There, Except for the politics. <laughs> There is almost a, a, a building-like quality to this skyline in a way that you've created this horizontal-like creation in some way where these books could almost substitute for buildings in a way on a, on a skyline. At least one, that could be one. Well, the silhouette way. does suggest yes. that. But they also could refer to, just as I mentioned, these, these personal things used as a tool of learning that were shelved at the end of the day and put aside till the following day. So it's almost something about how the passage of time at a different point in time will evolve. So. You are a proud son of Illinois. What makes you a quintessential Illinois artist, a contemporary artist? What is it about growing up in Illinois? Is there an Illinois school of art? Well, as you may or may not know, um, in terms of, forgive me for interrupting, in terms of, uh, I guess, a recognition that Chicago was an art center, it happened back in the I'll say 60s and 70s, there was a school called the Images Movement, also the Harry Who, that brought up attention to us from all over the world. Um, and that's probably where, if there is a link between me and the past, in terms of the historical past of Chicago art, is that at that point in time, the Images and the Harry Who Movement, they were known for the object quality, the, the, the incredible finesse and care of fracture that was put into all their works, whether, regardless of medium. And so I would say, well, my work is not figurative. The human form is not considered, really. Uh, I'm more rooted in the architecture school in Chicago than the art school. But I would say that this, this need and love and desire to make something well, succeed or not, is probably the most important thing in my work. I think that is where the communication is. Well, John Fraser, I think just looking at some, only a mere sampling of the works that are on display here at this gallery, um, I think you have succeeded. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's another edition of In the Artist's Words from the William Campbell Contemporary Gallery in Fort Worth. I'm Andrew Martin. Thank you again.